The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the hostess for this podcast. We are, I think, at episode number 152 with this episode, 151 or 152, but we're getting very close to the end of our third year podcasting. I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. We sincerely hope that it has given you some message of hope and a message that help is available and that it has spurred you to take action if you know someone who is addicted or if you yourself is addicted. I want to remind you to please subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and also subscribe and watch us on YouTube. We are interviewing, doing our interviews in video as well as audio as often as we can. And so you can find us on YouTube at our channel, which is the Addiction Podcast Point of No Return. So today we're going to talk to a beautiful young woman named Allie Severino. Allie Severino was born in Inglewood, New Jersey. As a child, Allie moved frequently between New York, New Jersey, and Florida, becoming a student at over 20 different schools. This affected her in many ways before she ever picked up a drink or a drug. Allie became a part of the foster care system at 12 and eventually relocated for good with her father to South Florida. Allie had already developed a history of drug abuse, but moving to Florida in the midst of a pill mill epidemic became the catalyst toward full-blown addiction. This toxic lifestyle started to quickly take an intense turn in June of 2007 when Severino was arrested for a laundry list of felony charges, including multiple charges of drug trafficking. Today, she is a tenacious crusader in the current drug crisis. Allie has devoted her life's work to breaking down the stigma associated with substance use disorders and increasing access to care for all who experience them. Allie speaks regularly with schools, drug court officials, judges, teachers, parents, and those like herself who are dealing with addiction. Let's talk to Allie. Allie, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate your willingness to share your story. Of course. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, I think that um, a lot of times people don't want to share this part of their lives because it oftentimes is not maybe the best time of your life when you're addicted. But I feel like when you share a story like yours that it's going to resonate with somebody. Yeah. And you know, I was that person for a really long time. You know, the first probably five years of my recovery, at least I was in total anonymity everywhere I went work. And I just did not tell any, you know, I just never told anyone. I still don't, you know, even when I do shows or whatever, I never really say what program I work. I try to keep that, but you know, I've, started telling my story and it's nice. That's and once awesome. it's removed, it's better. <laughs> well, it helps people. I know it does. Yeah, totally. So how did you tell us about your drug history? How did you get started on drugs? Um, so, you know, I, I guess I started experimenting at a young age, though at a very young age, let's say seven, eight, I was like the biggest dare advocate kid, right? So that was totally me because both my parents drank a lot. And so I just, I hated it. And I bought into D.A.R.E. I was like, they are totally right. You're going to die and be awful if you do drugs. And um, I guess my first experience, I was at a, you know, a good friend's house. Her older sister smoked weed. They had this bong out and she was like, hey, hey, like, and she went to go and I like blew, I blew the lighter out. I was like, no, like, what are you doing? Oh my God. Like, can't do that so bad. And she was like, no, it's not. And she did it. And I remember I tried to hit it then next. And I blew the water in. So if you blew the water in a bong, you know, it comes out spout. I don't know. I was probably not. I think I was in fifth grade. So, you know, after that, I started to experiment a little bit more. I guess I saw other people doing it. And um, the interesting thing is every time I tried my first drug, I don't think I ever really loved it right? Which is some people have that have that love the first time they do it. And it's like forever. Like for me, I didn't have that, but I kept doing it until the time I did it. And I was like, Oh, I really like this. Hmm. You know, and it, weird. Right. And, uh, so, you know, I guess at nine smoke weed, 
what sixth grade? I don't know. Sixth, seventh grade, smoking weed regularly. Um, I, you know, my home life was different. I had lived with my mom until I was seven. And when I was seven, um, I went to go, I ended up with my dad. It's a long story. My mom doesn't love me telling it. She wants to sue me. <laughs> anyway, so um, I started living with my dad and uh, it's, you know, me, him, my stepmom, he's sober. My dad had five years in sobriety and I used to remember him coming home with his coins and all this stuff. Uh, but eventually, you know, my dad did, you know, slip, he relapsed. And um, around that time, I went into foster care for about a year, a little over a year. And I guess during that time, I started acting out more than ever. Um, I guess when my dad, you know, started acting out, so did I. And I don't know, I haven't really seen a lot of therapists, but I'm sure it has something to do with that. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I went to probably 30 different schools. And maybe that had something with me feeling like I didn't fit in, but drugs were a way for me to fit in with people and make friends easily and whatever. So cocaine, ecstasy, weed were like the main things I never drank though, because mm. I hate alcohol because my parents, right? So um, my dad, when I get out of foster care, you know, he's supposed to stop drinking because he lost me because of drinking. Right. And he had to do all these things and, you know, parenting classes. And I finally get home and uh, he cracks a beer. And I kind of like had this shift in my mentality. Yeah. And um, I was like, well, fuck it. Or, can I curse? Am That's I fine. Okay, I'm sorry. No, it's totally okay. I just have to say that um, when I put it up um, for the feed that it's not clean. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, after that, I was like, well, I'll do what I want to do too then. You know, I mean, if you couldn't do this for me, then, you know, I'm not going to try to be better because I had this idea that I was going to go home and be better. And since he wasn't, I wasn't. And now, you know, as I've gotten older, I look back and I realize that's addiction. We can't quit because we love our kids, right? That's not how it works. And, you know, so I don't, I don't, I love my dad. Me and him are so close today, but then he decides we're going to move to Florida. I lived in New York. <laughs> in New York. And uh, I was like, what? Like, the, my whole life is here. Are you crazy? Like, I have a boyfriend. We're 15, 14. We're going to get married. <laughs> and, um, you know, and this is, you know, just kind of the little side notes until we get into it. But so we moved down to Florida and um, I moved down to Florida in the midst of a pill mill epidemic. Right. This was 2005. Yep. So they were everywhere. It yep. was, yeah, I had never seen pills like that in New York and I was introduced to them my first week down here. Um, wow. Yeah. From by cool. a friend or. Yeah. I was sitting in class and this girl was like, Hey, do you have any French fries? And I was like, I don't even know what that is. She was like, <laughs> uh, Zannies or whatever. There was Xanax, but I had never even heard of what Xanax was. Right. And I was like, no. She's like, you got to try it. And I was like, all right. And I was trying to make friends because, again, I'm in a new school with new people. And I wasn't really sure how to do that without smoking weed to connect with them. Uh, so I try Xanax. I don't remember it like most people who do Xanax, right? And, um, and I guess it just starts to evolve from there. I had been selling a little stuff here and there, ecstasy. Uh, but so, yeah, so at that point I'm doing Xanax regularly, cocaine and smoking weed. And selling. And selling. Yeah. And I'm, okay. I'm 14, about to be 15. So, um, want me to keep going? Yeah. And how old are you at this point? I'm 15. Okay. So now I'm in West Boca Raton, Florida, which just, you know, I wasn't that kid. So it was very, it was the only school, like I said, I've been to 30 schools. Right. It was the only school I puked before my first day. I was so nervous. Oh, wow. It was so different, right? Like there was just so much money and it was just, I was so nervous. And um, I made friends quickly though. My, I made a best friend across the street. His name was Zach. And uh, we became two peas in a pod and he was a little bit older and he was getting off of uh, heroin, which I didn't know at the time. And, um, you know, 
long story short, it just progressed, right? I just started to party a lot. I started to make friends who were partying and I started to sell ecstasy more than ever. And that was, you know, my thing. And I stuck to cocaine and Xanax for a while, a lot though, so much that I just genuinely don't remember, you know, at least a year. And I started keeping track of it because I'm just that kind of person. I had this little black book and I would write what drugs and like what I did every day because I couldn't remember because I'm taking, you know, 20 milligrams of Xanax a day and uh, I can't remember anything. So I'm writing in this book everything that I'm doing, right? One gram of Coke, you know, this, whatever. And um, there was a night where I was supposed to be work and I worked at Party City and uh, I was supposed to be working and I didn't go in and I ended up eating a bunch of muscle relaxers, somas. And, you know, I like, I guess it was like an overdose. I was like going into convulsions and I don't remember anything. And I burnt myself all over with cigarettes, whatever. And after that, I was like, oh my God, I need to slow down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like it was just a really bad night. You know, I'm not going to get into all this, but it was really bad. You know? <laughs> Like really bad. Okay, Ali, I just have one question though. Do you still have the book? Do you ever pick it up and look at it? Oh, no, I wish I did. Yeah. And you know, no, my dad moved when I was in rehab and he got rid of like all my stuff, you know, because people were coming there threatening him. It was, I left my dad in a terrible position. I got it. Yeah. I wish though, but I remember after that night, I wrote Somas, right? I got to quit. I got to stop doing this shit. And I made a firm resolution, me and a friend of mine, we said, we're not doing it. We're going to stop just weed. You know, we're just going to smoke weed. And I did that for two days. <laughs> That's how long I lasted. Two yeah. days. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to, at then you don't know, you don't know then that like, this is like, you know, this cycle and you have this obsession. That's not like a thing that you're aware of at 15 years old. You know, but I just knew that, like, I've made this huge pact to stop, and I didn't. Well, especially at 15, you're invincible. Nothing can hurt you. Nothing's ever going to harm you. You know, eating bad food doesn't hurt you, you know, so you can stop the drugs whenever you want. Right. My friends used to say, he used to say, oh, because I used to just walk across, like, I used to walk across the street, not look. He'd be like, oh, I'm Allie. Cars don't hit me. I hit cars, right? Right. (laughs) That was literally my mentality, right? Yep. And uh, so, you know, uh, eventually, you know, I'm really selling ecstasy. I start doing, I had done oxys a couple times, but I didn't like them. Like every other drug I tried, they weren't my favorite. They made me tired and I like to be up. Um, And I did them one, the third time I did them, I fell in love. Mm -hmm. And I did them every single day after that. Every, I never missed a day after that third time. And, um, you know, life just changed so quickly. Before it was kind of manageable and, you know, I had friends and then, but my whole school was on these drugs. Back then we didn't have these powerful speakers that came in. We didn't have this education that we have today. We didn't have any of this stuff. And so we didn't really know that like these drugs were so addicting. We didn't know what our lives were gonna become the first time we used them. Would it have made a difference? I'm not sure, but maybe. And so I go on that path and then I start selling them and then we're doctor shopping and then I'm living at, you know, my boyfriend's apartment because my dad had kicked me out because he knows what's up. He knows that I'm selling because when you have these pills, I mean, the kids are like, they're coming by the dozen, like by the busload to pick them up. And, uh, and there was this one guy I had met at a rave club and he had been buying ecstasy off me and I was, I didn't really like him to begin with, but I'll tell you why. So I had a bad feeling about him. <laughs> so I had been selling to him and, you know, it was like three times I'd sold him a few hundred ecstasy pills and the, the last time he wanted a thousand. And I was like, fuck, no way, right? <laughs> that is such a setup. No way. He wants a thousand and he wants to pay this much. Like that doesn't sound right to me, but me and my boyfriend are so strung out. Cause remember I might be selling drugs, but I'm broke. Okay. Cause I am getting high. Right. I don't have any 
money. I don't have food. I'm living off of Slim Jims and Arizona iced teas. That was literally what I ate every day. And, you know, you know, it's not this luxury lifestyle. I'm, I'm sleeping on the floor in an apartment with the drug, you know, the guy who I'm paying to go to the doctor because he's an actual adult living in my bedroom, you know, freaking out every day. It's a just disgusting, gross, power turned off place. It's not like, sounds nice. I forgot to add all that stuff. Right. right? So <laughs> No, it wasn't fun. Um, and uh, yeah, so my boyfriend just couldn't resist, right? He had to answer the phone for this guy because we were being greedy and we needed money. <laughs> and so he answered the phone and he was like, listen, I'll take whatever you got. We said, we have Oxy 80s, we got Roxy's, like whatever. He was like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll take a bunch. He took a bunch of stuff. And I said, okay, we'll meet you. Now me and my boyfriend at the time were like, this is it we are leaving this drug dealer in here because he's going to murder us when he finds out that we spent the rent money on drugs. Okay. <laughs> uh, everything's like, fuck. and like, he's literally going to kill us. So we need to get out of here. We're going to do this last deal and we're going home. I had my bags, my, I had, you know, trash bags full of my clothes. I already brought it to my dad's, you know, his mom already had a plan for him to go to treatment that we didn't even know about. We go do this last deal and I'm sitting in the car because we're sell selling them a few different items. So different price points, I need a calculator. I'm high. I don't know what's going on. I'm like calculating things, you know, and oh I look up and it's the organized crime task force. Oh, no. oh my God. Oh. They're guns, masks, like Jesus. Like I was like, me, you're here for me. <laughs> You know, I, th I throw the drugs at the confidential informant, this guy who's been meeting with me. I'm like, he did this. Like, he was that guy. And they're like, no, you get out. Right. Now I'm like, oh my God, is this real? Like, what just happened? Like, what just, what just happened? And, uh, but of course, being not, I'm 17 at the time. I think 17, what are they going to do? Put me in jail, you know? someone told me that it's a myth guys you can definitely go to jail if you're under 18. okay so, that's a very good point i hope people listening get that you can go to jail under 17 yeah. I mean under 18. Huh. yeah so you're 12. i was in there with 12 year olds okay like you wow. can go to jail at any age it was crazy so whatever they want to contact my parents i'm like they're dead they don't exist i don't know who you're going to contact because my dad's literally going to murder me like my dad's an army militant like <laughs> guy okay? he's not compassionate towards this kind of stuff and was he clean and sober at the time no no oh okay no. he was drinking you know but you know my dad's always held a great job and he's very functioning you know okay. and so he's and even the drinking makes it even scarier because you know when people drink and they get angry it's just volatile right and um so eventually they have to call him and he's like yeah i don't care i told you to stop you know bye <laughs> Okay. And I said, I told you guys that's what was going to happen. I don't know why you made me call him, you know, just send me up the river. You know, I, what are you going to send me next? So they sent me to the juvenile detention center and, uh, you know, I was there detoxing, you know, I was there detoxing and they had no idea what was going on because it wasn't common back then. You know, we got this, this was 13 years ago, this was like 2007, I think 13 years ago. Yeah. And, uh, so you were dope sick basically. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm have a screeching habit. I'm doing, you know, five oxy eighties a day, maybe 10 roxy thirties. Like that's just like, you can't even get, they don't even make them anymore. You know, like oh. these drugs were so powerful and, uh, yeah, I was very sick and, um, you know, the staff there, you know, the, the CEOs or whatever, they're just giving me the hardest time and, no one knew what to do. And I was in there for four drug trafficking charges. Now I'm facing 120 years in prison. I don't wow. even care if I'm so sick. All I can think of is getting high. And my boyfriend who ended up telling on me anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's love. It's yeah. just drugs, guys. You're not in love. <laughs> Trust me. Okay. Wow. So, uh, so yeah, I go do my arraignment. They're like 120 years. I'm like, this is crazy. I'm 12. What do you mean 120 years? Like, right. And they say, uh, you know, we're going to see if we're going to file and charge you as an adult. And so they have like 20 something days to do that. Wow. And they don't do that by like, the, let's say 21. 
they don't do that by the 21st day at five o'clock you get released wow right? okay so i'm like all right let's hope they forget <laughs> wishful thinking right so it's the 21st day it's 4 55 and i'm like they forgot like they don't know right and i'm sitting there and it's 4 59 no paperwork is coming for me yet i'm like i'm going home today and at 4 59 paperwork comes in fax machine was also broken so they couldn't even send me up that day i had to wait a whole extra day whatever i was like ah oh. and the next day they brought me to you know the adult jail Wow. down here in Florida. And um, I got a bond of $80,000, which I thought my dad, 80 grand, you know, like I thought that was not a lot because I'm an idiot because I'm a kid and we were dumb as kids. And, um, and, and you'd you know, probably was, made that amount selling drugs over and over, right? Yeah, I guess. I spent it all on drugs. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. just saying that might be part of the reason, like, oh, 80 grand's not that much. I mean, I've right. turned that over in a week, you know. Right. No, yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm with you on that. Yes. <laughs> yes, probably. I have never thought about that. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, but my dad let me sit there, you know, and, but I was feeling better. I was starting to feel better and it felt good because I had energy again. And, you know, I was having these like little fake parties in my cell with my bunkie, like eating moon pies and oatmeal cream pies and just like, <laughs> you know, singing and dancing because I just had this life back in me because the drugs were out of my system and I'm always such a happy person. Okay. And that person was coming back out and I knew I was in there because of drugs. I knew that was the reason why I was there 1000%. Can't do this anymore. This is so dumb. I have to, I cannot do this when I get home. And, uh. A month or so later, my dad bonds me out. I get bonded out to be put on house arrest on pretrial release. So now I'm going to be on house arrest until this is sorted. And um, I, you know, I'm not allowed to go back to high school. That's over. You know, it's all over. And I get home and my friends find out I'm home and I'm not going to do drugs. And they're like, we're smoking an ounce blunt. I'm like, ounce blunt? Like, that's a lot of weed, right? What's it called? Oh, an ounce? You yeah, a whole ounce. They're going to okay. roll a whole ounce. Into I got it. Okay. And I go, oh, I can't do that. Like, guys, I'm going to get drug tested. Save me the roach. The roach of an ounce blunt is like a regular blunt, you know? Like, I just, you know, the thinking I had, it just makes no sense when I go back and I'm like, what was I doing? Right. And so I do that, immediately have a panic attack because I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to get caught, right? Like, that was, so why would I smoke weed? Why would I just do a regular drug? This was so dumb. And so... Within a week, I'm selling drugs again out of my window, I'm back on pills, and you know, you know how the story goes. Yep. yep. And so to fast forward through all of that house arrest, six months worth of house arrest, you know, I ended up pleading with Will Fender. I had a judge that was amazing and who believed in me when I didn't believe in myself because I, I actually asked for a prison sentence because, you know, I had a lot of time to think on house arrest. and. I decided that I could not do this. I, I would not be able to stay sober uh, on the outside by myself. And so maybe prison was the best idea because if I fuck up later, I'm going to go for longer. And I just would rather get it out of the way right now and be out by the time I'm 20 or, you know, 21. And because they ended up getting to me down to three years, minimum mandatory. And um, so that's what we were going in there for. And the judge said no. <laughs> You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narconon Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I.org. Or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Two four. 
Sometimes. The hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. Jen said, no, I'm not doing this to this young girl. You know, she needs help and uh, you, you got to come up with a different plan. And so, you know, as pleading youthful offender, the highest amount of probation they could give me was six years. So they came back with the six years probation, two drug tests a month, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, two drug tests a month? Are you kidding me? I'm never going to be able to do this. And uh, I take it and now I'm homeless because I'm off house arrest. My dad is so fed up. He kicks me out. I'm sleeping at like local pools. I'm breaking into people's houses just to have shelter to sleep. I wasn't even stealing anything. I was like literally just sleeping in their houses unbeknownst to them. And um, oh, and then I started smoking crack, which, <laughs> you know, and then I thought, oh, I should sell crack right? And I'm on probation for drug trafficking, man. And you know, I know a lot of people have these stories and I guess mine's a little different. Maybe because I was just so dumb and young, but um, I, I had to go to treatment and this is the point of no return that you're talking about. Okay. So, but did you decide to go to treatment or was there an intervention oh, or was court oh, ordered? Court ordered treatment. Okay. Okay. Court ordered treatment, uh, court ordered assessment. I didn't have to go to treatment. I had to get an assessment done to see if I needed treatment. Now my PO was on my ass because I had been faking my piss test now for about a month and a half, you know, and she knew like, how do you not know? I look like a junkie, right? I'm like 80 pounds. I smoked crack on my way there. I look terrible. And you know, I'm passing these drug tests with flying colors. <laughs> Something's up. And so I go to get this assessment done and I had brought someone else's urine with me and um, I went to go take it. I didn't realize they were gonna watch me though. I thought this would be an easy one. And yeah, they watched me and the other person's urine did not go into the cup. It went all over me. Oh. Oh yeah, all over my pants. So now I'm in clothing with someone else's urine on it. Oh God. Right? <laughs> and I think I'm fucked. I fucking I fucked this all up. How could I have done that? And they need a urine sample from me, or I'm going to jail. And uh, that was the moment. Because I think because I was back in no corner, I didn't really have another option other than to be honest for the first time. Wow. And I said, "Is there someone I can talk to?" And they were like, well, like, what's up? I said, okay, I, if I take that drug test, I'm going to come up for every single thing on it. It's a 12 panel. I'm going to come up for every single thing on that drug test, everything. And I can't stop on my own. If this assessment is supposed to help you guys figure out whether I need inpatient treatment or whether I can do this on an outpatient basis, I'm telling you, I cannot do it on an outpatient basis. I need to go to treatment. I cannot stop. Please help me right? If I take this drug test, I'm never going to be able to go to treatment. I'm going to go to jail. Wow. And it took them like an hour or two. I'm having a panic attack. Finally, they're like, okay, okay. We will tell you when there's a bed open. And I'm like, okay. And I go home and my PO shows up with a cop to arrest me. Oh. Did, you, did you take your drug test today? I said, no, they didn't give me one. They didn't give you one? I said, nope. And she had to leave because she thought I was going to fail that drug test. And huh. that's how she showed up. And like, that's a like, you know, I just felt like my higher power was just like holding on to me <laughs> like a football player, you know, until he could just get me to the goal line. Like he was like, God, Allie, <laughs> I feel you myself. I made you, right? And uh, 
Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I didn't stop after that until I got my bed in treatment. I got pulled over with about $400 worth of crack on me that fell out in front of a cop. I like did all these dumb things and I uh, got out of them and uh, had a few guns pulled on me. I was stealing, I stole a car. That was so stupid. Whatever. I finally get my bed there though. And uh, yeah. And where, where was the facility? What was it? It was called the Drug Abuse Foundation, Delray Beach, Florida. It's our state you know, nonprofit uh, rehab center. So it's okay. a state grant rehab center. Um, it was crap. <laughs> it was crap. <laughs> but you got clean and sober, right? I did. Yeah. It was and amazing. when was that? That was in 2008. So I got in there February 2008. Okay. Yeah, my clean date is December 15, 2008, because I ended up drinking nine months later. But I got there President's Day weekend. I had gotten kicked out initially because I smuggled a bottle of Jaeger in there <laughs> and uh, had to go to another detox, which has since closed down. It was our other state-funded program, CARP, and um, I had to go there, and then I had to wait a few days, and yeah, and then I finally got back in there, and um, I thought they cured you. That's how I thought rehab worked. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I thought, like, you know, <sighs> yeah. So not that easy. No, no, it wasn't that easy at all. It was terrible. My friends, when they were in rehab, I used to ask them like, so are you still going to drink? <laughs> <laughs> Did they cure you? I remember asking that question, like, cause I thought that's how it worked, but maybe that was good that I thought it that way. Cause I thought this is over. If I'm going to survive, if I'm going to live any kind of life, I can't, this, this is it. Right. This so how long were you in the treatment facility? Six months. Six months. Okay. And then what was it like when you got out? What was life like? Oh, well, so the last couple of months you're in a sober living kind of, uh, kind of, right? You gotta, you're allowed to go to work and you have to be home at six o'clock at night. So, um, I had started to try to work then. And I didn't, because you got to think, I didn't have a driver's license. I didn't have a driving permit. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a GED or a high school diploma or I didn't have anything. I didn't even have a bank account. I didn't know how to open a bank account. I was only 18. I just turned 18. And um, so I guess that was the biggest struggle in the beginning was find, you know, getting that foothold on life. Like, how do you do this? <laughs> right. Right. You know, it's interesting. Um uh, in much earlier podcasts, um, the fellow on the podcast with me would mention the fact that when you, when you are addicted to drugs, when you're a teenager, you miss a lot of life skills training that a lot of younger people get when they're not doing drugs. And so, there you are. Yeah, you know, you didn't get to finish high school, and I can, I can, I can understand the position you're in because you missed all of that because you were doing drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, totally. I miss, you know, and you get your permit in high school. They have a class for that, but I just didn't go to, you know? Right. And so, yeah, I miss a lot of that stuff. And so, thank God, though, I was like the youngest person there. So, you know, the older people that I was surrounding myself with, they helped me. They brought me to go get that permit. I failed it the first time. They paid for me to take it the second time, you know? Yep. And uh, thank God for them. Because my dad, you know, our relationship was still very rocky at the time. Right. What, he's supposed to believe that I'm changing now. You know, why would he believe that? Right. I get, you know, I get it. I'm grateful for it. And so I slept on a friend's couch. I didn't know about real sober living. So I thought where I was, was the only type of sober living. Uh, you know, the internet wasn't as big then. It wasn't like how it is now. Right. And it makes me sound so old, but <laughs> right. So uh, you know, I, I start saying on a friend's, oh, I made a boy, I met a boyfriend in rehab. Okay. Yeah. We How all did that go? That well, just kidding. <laughs> uh, but you know, we, we survived with each other for a little bit. And then, you know, when I had around nine months, I drank, I ended up drinking. I wasn't working, you know, for me, I wasn't working a program. I had stopped. I had stopped doing all the things that they taught me to do, uh, to get better. And um, I drank and the next morning I woke up and I said, either I got to tell somebody about this and be honest, or this might continue. 
So I did. I tried to call somebody. I said, listen, I drank. I felt like shit because I never drank. I've never really drank before. And I was like, what do I do? I feel terrible. And they're like, we're not going to tell you what to do. <laughs> you know, I guess it was drink more alcohol or whatever. And uh, they're like, go to a meeting. I was like, okay, I'm at this meeting all gross. I'm like weeping, you know, because <laughs> I like, lost nine months. I couldn't believe I did that. And um, that day I started over. And I, you know, and I didn't stop after that. Yeah. You know, that's awesome. I, I, I know it's not easy. I mean, I haven't been there. I can't tell you personally that I've been there, but I've talked to enough people that I know that it's not easy to stay clean and sober and kudos to you for staying clean and sober. And I'm just going to say, or don't take this as judgment, but having one drink, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to fault you that one. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I understand why you had to do what you had to do and call and go to meetings and stuff, but right. you could have gone on a binge. You didn't go on a binge and you didn't do exactly. drugs. So, yeah. okay. I'm going to yeah. count your sober day as president's day. You <laughs> so you're, so you're almost, what is that? 12 years, 14 yeah. years, 14 mm -hmm. years, right? 2008. 2008. 12 yeah. years. Yeah. 12 years. Yeah, I can't count. 12. I just got my 11. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 12. <laughs> yeah, nine months makes a difference. So, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, so how, what, what kind of jobs did you get? Did you start working? What did you start doing after that? Oh, that was hard because of all the felonies and stuff. But uh, I started cleaning houses uh, right away. Uh, there was this lady there. She cleaned houses. She let me go with her, which was cool. And I remember the first time I found drugs at a house, right? And I like, because all those things are really important in the beginning of recovery. You're like, yeah, oh, I just found a bunch of pills. What do I do? You tell somebody right away, you know, exactly. Like, I'm not going to take them, but I got to yeah. tell somebody. I remember making all those, you know, like early recovery decisions, you know, <laughs> right away. I, I found these things here and, um, you know, I did that. And then I started waitressing. I got a job at a bar, which they hated me because I didn't drink and I wasn't a fun waitress, you know, I was right. a, not fun waitress, I guess. And so they kind of fired me and then I worked, you know, little, little jobs like that. I finally got a job at a country club serving i worked there for a year and um my dad helped me get that job it was really hard for me to get a job so had you got you guys had started to reconcile then <clears throat> yeah yeah that was probably about a year or two into my recovery probably two years into my recovery yeah we definitely started to talk more um but not like how we do now you know like i still would never have a key to his house or anything like that at that point and um yeah so he helped he helped me get that job and that was all right. I got fired because I'm not the server type, especially at a country club. But right, you know. So yeah. And then what I what did I do next? Allie, oh, did, let I, me let me stop you for just a second. Did you just do the one rehab? Is that the only rehab program you did? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'm sorry. You were then going to say where you went in terms of work. Uh, you know, cause like, you know, after that, it was like, I didn't know what I wanted to do. What, what do I want to be? I'm not going to college. I am in college now, but then I thought <laughs> it was very dumb. I was like, all right, I'm not spending all that money. Like that's crazy. <laughs> right. And, uh, so I got into sales and then I, you know, a little bit after that, I started my magazine. I started a magazine called fresh start and it was an addiction recovery magazine i did it anonymously no one know, knew that i made it besides the people that maybe bought ads but my name wasn't in it and i would write recovery literature and i would sell ads to rehab centers and you know i would distribute the magazine and i would design it and you know i had fresh start for a few years wow yeah what happened to it uh so i ended up opening a sober living after that and that kind of took a lot of my time and I tried hiring people to keep up on the magazine selling ads and stuff, but they just, they just couldn't do it. And I couldn't do both, you know, and now I was responsible for these 24 men, you know, guys. And that, you know, that ended up being the best thing I ever did. I was so happy doing that. I was really uh, so happy doing that. And, um, you know, that just has, that's probably the favorite, my favorite thing I've ever done. And so, but then, you know, the rehab center started to get a little greedy, blah, blah, blah. So we exited and we just sold, you know, the property to them. And, you know, it was kind of not as fun at that point because it was all about you know. the money. Right. Because you were more about helping people. Yeah. And, you know, we had like this camaraderie and I just saw how they did stuff and it just, I just didn't feel right to me. You know, I get that they have to make money, like totally like, 
I agree with that. You know, they wouldn't be able to treat people if they didn't have any money. But, you know, for a sober living level of care, I just thought it should be different. So, right. you know, it was just time for me to go. And um, after that is when we started filming for our film, American Relapse. That's awesome. Tell me about American Relapse. What was that, what was that like? So it was so uh, interesting. This kid I went to high school with, he called me, he goes, oh, Allie, the treatment industry, it's crazy down there right now, huh? And I'm like, yeah, it is, right? And he goes, you still have the magazine? I go, kind of, you know, the articles are online, whatever. He said, can I talk to you? I said, sure. And he starts asking me questions about the industry, right? Like the urine testing, the brokering, the this, the that. And he goes, man, I want to do something with this. Can we come down there and maybe you like show us around a little bit? Because you got, this was probably, what year are we? This is probably 2018, maybe? 2016 when we 16. filmed. Oh, okay. So it was crazy then. There was no task force yet. There was none of that stuff, right? It was kind of still very Wild West-like. Right. And so he came down, we filmed a little bit, and uh, they brought it back to some other people. And then randomly they're like, hey, and they wanted other people to do it. I was like, here, talk to all these people. They'll be great on film. I don't know if I'll be, you know, I don't know if I will like it or I think that's <laughs> weird. I don't know. I don't know if I'll get hired at another place again. I don't know what my life will be if I do something like this, you know? And uh, I ended up doing it. And they came down for a weekend and they filmed us for, you know, Monday or Friday through Monday. And I thought it was a lot of work they want to be with you all day right i was like geez i don't slow down <laughs> you know, this is just for fun you know, no one's getting paid right we're just doing this documentary that's gonna come out one day like you know i don't know and so i think basically it's just maybe something that i'll see one day i'll have when i'm old no one else is ever gonna see it and uh then they turn it into a sizzler reel or whatever and we end up getting picked up for a season of uh, Dope Sick Nation on Viceland. Wow. Which was crazy. And that was an amazing experience. I learned so much. I had such a great time. We were able to help so many people. Wow. And, uh, you did get paid for that one, right? Yeah. Thank okay, God. Good. All right. <laughs> they work you like 13 hours a day. Wow. You know, like it's hard work, this show business stuff. <laughs> yes, I never it is. Knew. And, you know, geez, the camera guys, we probably had like a 15 person squadron, you know, that wasn't even editing. It was really something else to see all this stuff. It was really cool. And, you know, the people who worked with the same people for the movie as the show. And so we ended up getting close and I trusted them more. And when I trusted them more, things were better because before I was scared, you know, like, what right. are they going to do? Are they going to make me seem bad or whatever? And everyone wants to tell you that, like, well, you don't know how they're going to edit it. And you're like, well, yeah, they can only edit it so many ways, you know, like, whatever. I'm not going to look so, too bad. Right, you can't look that bad, you know, like, what are they going to do? And so, and, you know, they, they did a great, they did, Pat McGee and Adam Lincoln Health did such a good job. I am so grateful that, you know, it was them that this opportunity arose with. And, you know, the film ended up, we ended up winning, you know, International, Rhode Island International Film Festival. I think we won eight or nine film festivals a few of them were international we got on the short list for the uh academy awards wow so like, you know, <laughs> we were like on the list or whatever like yeah <laughs> and uh you know now now the movie's on hulu and um a whole bunch of other you know things like that and i'm like what people are gonna really actually see it i hate my hair like <laughs> oh, I, I had blue hair in it i'm like why did i do that you know like oh <laughs> But yeah, no, it was really cool. It's all about the message, Allie. The message. Yeah. <laughs> so what what are you doing now? What's your passion now? So um, you know, it was hard after all of that stuff to like figure out you're like what you're kinda left like, what do I do? You know, like that was so fun. What what else is there to do? And um I feel like my higher power has always brought stuff into my life like that. You know, I've been very lucky to, or blessed, whatever you want to look at it is to, but I always say yes. I say yes to a lot of things people say no to, you know, I'll say yes to anything. Okay. And life's about mainly just showing up, you know, which is what I did for the movie. I just showed up. I didn't even want to do it. And um, so, you know, I'm in college now 
Um, so you can what degree are you going after? Business marketing. Okay. So I think that that's fun. I think I can work anywhere with that, you know, whether, you know, I think it's great to have that kind of degree. And um, I'm very early, you know, far from being at the degree part. That's okay. You know, it's great to be in school. I, I used to hate it. God, I hated it so much. I told everyone, just Google it. Like, what do you need to go to college for? And let me tell you, if your confidence is low, go to college. If you don't know what to do, go to college. If you're lazy, <laughs> go to college. Because if you're a college student, you can just be like, I'm in college, you know, and everyone kind of forgives you for everything. It is the best. You guys are missing out if you're not in school right now. So go to school. And um, I work at Addiction Helpline America. So they're kind of like an online... You know, it's a directory because instead of just working for one facility, I felt like, I don't know, I just felt like it was so like, oh, I can like tell this person to go here. Like, why? Right. There's a country full of amazing facilities. You know, yours is not always the best for every patient. And that's wrong for me to send them to whatever place. So, you know, just to be able to have them go on this site and just look up everything that's near them. Right. And, you know, whatever is best for you and I'll talk to you and help you out with it. But, you know, so for them, I make videos and I make content and that's, I like that, you know, they've given me the opportunity to just do things I love like video, right. you know, I've like been doing video editing and, and blog writing and being able to be creative and, you know, no rehab wanted that. They all want you to go get clients and do all this crap that I suck at. My clients don't have any money or insurance, you know, right. they're like, really help me. <laughs> <laughs> they're all like that, you know, so it just wasn't a good fit for me. And, um, you know, this is much better. So I do that. And I started speaking with Michael DeLeon. Um, ah, yes. Yeah. At, at schools. And I'm super pumped about that. Because like I said, when I was younger, there was none of that education being brought in. That's very true. It was just say no, but there was no information right. on why say no. Why? Yeah, you why should that? Yeah. yeah. And, you can, and you know, if you talk to kids like they're stupid and you think that you can be dogmatic with them and say, well, just say no, it's not going to work. And, right. you know, Ali, you said that you thought maybe if you'd had more information as a young person, you might not have done some of the drugs. Well, I actually believe that's true. And so you going into schools and actually giving the kids true data, like, hey, right. I'm not just preaching to you. I've been there, I've done that. So I know what I'm talking about. I think that that's, I think it's major. And I think that, you know, if nothing else with this whole epidemic, of addiction, I think that the whole drug education area, I think is huge because how I can't tell you how many people we talked to on the podcast that started when they were nine or 12, right? you know, and they didn't have any educate drug education. I'm with you. I think it's crazy. Like, like it, and, and his, the way he does it, like the literature, it's awesome. Cause he, like you said, he's real. They come with facts. They don't talk to them like they're dumb because these kids, we look at them as kids, but they're like grown adults in their school, you know, like they That's got right. boyfriends and girlfriends and they have a whole life that, you know, we just. And they're not kids. stupid. Kids they're are not dumb. stupid. Nice. You know, people think yeah. sometimes they can talk, talk around kids and they don't get it. Yeah, they get it. You know, kids well, are yeah. not stupid. And so if you give them the facts, um, they're going to get it and they're going to learn it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited for that. That's or, awesome. Yeah. So, Allie, we figure that we've got a lot of um, friends and families of addicts that listen to the podcast and also addicts we know because some have reached out to us. If you could give them all one message, what would that message be? <laughs> this is a hard one. one well, I mean, for the families, I have to say, you guys, you know, if you, the family members, you guys might have to do stuff that your loved one is not going to be happy about right now. And that doesn't mean that they're not going to love and forgive you. You are saving their life. And it's what any good mom or dad would do. You know, you got to be tough, even though it hurts you to see them hurt. Sometimes it's for the better. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you got, you can't enable these kids. You, you got to cut it out. That's right. and, um, 
you know, it's, it's one of the biggest issues I, I deal with, you know, when I talk to families, it's really hard. They bankrupt themselves, all this, you know, it's just so sad. And, um, you know, for the people that are struggling, you know, I, I believe in you. I believe in you. And I, I truly believe that you can do whatever you want. I was never supposed to be here, right? All the odds were stacked against me. Like I'm sure they're stacked against you right now with all the foster care and the drugs and the homelessness and the GED. And I've been able to make a life that I'm happy and proud of and that I wouldn't trade for anything. So I am convinced that you can do the same thing. And I hope that you do and believe in yourself. Wow. Allie, that's awesome. Thank you once again for being on the podcast today. I, I I think your story is like no other. I mean, there's similarities for sure, but I think that your story is going to resonate. And you're so delightful to talk to. And how you, you make this subject funny, I'm not sure how you do that. I know it's a serious subject, and you acknowledge that, but you just you make it fun. And and I wish you the best success with your career and your college and all of that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to. Uh, See who you have on next. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, you're awesome. Thank you for listening and watching today. I hope that you enjoyed Allie's story. She's very delightful and she's very animated, but you know, in all seriousness, she went through what a lot of you may have gone through or what your loved one is going through. And the whole point is they have to get help or you have to get help. And that's what we want for you. Do something about it now. Don't wait. Do it now. Make a call. Call the Addiction Helpline. Call Narconon. Call anywhere. Call Learn to Cope. But call somewhere that can give you help. You know, when you call a place like Narconon, it's anonymous. You don't have to give your name. You don't have to give any information about yourself. It's 866-231-5924. You can just ask questions. You can, you'll have somebody there that will understand what you're going through, whether it's you that's addicted or a loved one that's addicted. So do something about it today. Please, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star rating and watch us on YouTube and subscribe to our channel there. I will tell you for those of you who are not checking us out on YouTube that Ali Severino is beautiful. So you might want to go to YouTube and watch her as well as listen to her. Thank you so much for listening and we will be back again next week. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. For more information on Narconon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcononojai.org. Narconon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.